Hello, my name is Ken. I was diagnosed with an eye condition called central retinal vein occlusion in 2002. I'm not a doctor and I have no medical training, so remember to consult your physician without delay when making medical decisions. In prior videos, we examined the general nature of helpful and harmful blood clots. In this video, we'll look at blood clots, thrombi, that form in the central retinal vein. Are they really the cause of central retinal vein occlusion? Why do they form? And how does the body deal with them? Answers to questions like these may help us as patients understand more about what's happening inside our eyes throughout the course of this condition. Much of what we know with regard to these questions is the result of a century-long succession of tissue studies that began in the late 1800s. These tissue studies involved donated eyes typically from individuals with severe central retinal vein occlusion who had their eye removed after developing uncontrolled neovascular glaucoma. In the most recent of these studies, Dr. Green and fellow researchers found a thrombus in all of the 29 donated eyes they examined. Having tissue samples in which the time elapsed from the occlusion to the time of removal of the eye varying from as little as 6 hours all the way up to 15 years, Dr. Green built a case for interpreting the occlusive changes seen in the central retinal vein of these eyes as the normal evolution of a thrombus over time, from a fresh thrombus all the way through the process of organization to the remnants of an old thrombus. General sentiment seems to have gravitated toward Dr. Green's line of thinking with regard to the prominent role of thrombus formation in these severe cases of central retinal vein occlusion. However, a number of cases brought forth during the century-long debate raise at least the possibility that some of these cases of severe central retinal vein occlusion may not involve a thrombus. And little actual evidence is available on the milder cases of central retinal vein occlusion, few of which have ever been studied in this way. Before we go any further, let's stop to take a closer look at the central retinal vein. As you may recall, the central retinal artery and the central retinal vein run for a short distance through the center of the optic nerve. In order for the central retinal vessels and the fibers of the optic nerve to pass into the back of the eye, they must traverse a structure called the lamina cribrosa. This enlarged cross-section of the lamina cribrosa will show the tiny openings through which the central retinal artery, the central retinal vein, and the nerve fibers pass. The connective tissue fibers that form the meshwork around these openings provides the support and snug fit necessary to contain the internal pressure of the eye. In Dr. Green's tissue study, they found that in each of the 29 eyes examined, the thrombus was located here in the vicinity of the lamina cribrosa. The thrombus was located at or nearly behind the lamina cribrosa in a large majority of these eyes, about 83% and at or nearly in front of the lamina cribrosa in the remainder of the eyes. Understanding now a little more about this local environment of the central retinal vein, let's move on to the question, what factors might cause a thrombus to form here in the central retinal vein? Unfortunately, there's no simple answer to this question. In a prior discussion of Firko's triad, we saw that many circumstances may, especially when they occur in combination, contribute to thrombus formation. And just as these elements of Firko's triad are applicable throughout the rest of the body, they're also applicable in the local environment of the central retinal vein. In addition, there are problems that are more specific to this particular vein. First, there's the possibility of problems with external compression on the central retinal vein. For example, central retinal vein occlusion may occur because of arteriosclerosis, also known as hardening of the arteries. Long-standing high blood pressure, a common finding in persons with central retinal vein occlusion, may over time cause the walls of the central retinal artery to become thick and stiff. As the hardening progresses, the central retinal artery is thought to expand and crowd out the more pliable central retinal vein as together they pass through the lamina cribrosa. This compression may cause blood flow through the central retinal vein to become more turbulent, resulting in endothelial damage and possible thrombus formation. Similarly, as the high interocular pressure of many forms of glaucoma compresses and flexes the lamina cribrosa in an outward direction, it's conceivable that the central retinal vein might somehow become pinched or compressed. 
and advanced age itself, long associated with a higher incidence of central retinal vein occlusion, may cause a slow thickening of the fibers of the lamina cribrosa, which could possibly have some additional compressive effect. Other examples of compression along the length of the central retinal vein include swelling of the optic disc, optic distrusion, which are accumulations or pockets of cellular debris that may enlarge, harden, and eventually press on the retinal veins, bleeding within the optic nerve, possibly as a result of head trauma, and finally, the formation or expansion of a tumor behind the eye. In addition to the problems caused by compression of the central retinal vein, the walls of the central retinal vein itself may become inflamed or degenerated. When inflammation occurs in the walls of a vein, it's called phlebitis. Several of the tissue studies mentioned earlier in this video involve cases of inflammation in the central retinal vein wall. Dr. Coates suggested that this inflammation is more prevalent in the young, while sclerosis of the central retinal artery is more typical of older patients. Dr. Green seems to have felt that this inflammation was more of a reaction to the thrombus than a cause of thrombus formation. Degenerative changes in the central retinal vein wall observed by Dr. Klein included areas where the endothelium had pulled away from the vein wall, areas where there was swelling of the endothelium, and areas where the endothelial cells had unnaturally multiplied. A final group of local factors that may contribute to thrombus formation are problems of sluggish blood flow through the central retinal vein. Examples include anything that restricts the arterial supply of blood to the retinal venous system, like the artery narrowing effects of arteriosclerosis or atherosclerosis in the central retinal artery, and arterial spasms where the small arteries of the retina spontaneously constrict. Dr. Hayray suggests that normal nighttime reductions in blood pressure may also result in sluggish blood flow through the central retinal vein, causing a gradual cumulative night-by-night -night expansion of the thrombus in the central retinal vein. He also points out that increases in interocular pressure, that is pressure within the eye, tend to resist the flow of blood through the retina, potentially causing blood to stagnate and thereby contribute to thrombus formation. As discussed in a prior video, hyperviscosity, thicker than normal blood, is also regularly mentioned in connection with slower than normal blood flow through the central retinal vein. Now let's turn to a final question. When these clots form, how does the body deal with the thrombus in the central retinal vein? There are several ways that the body might try to deal with these clots. First, the body will probably try to dissolve the clot. If for some reason, though, the body is not able to generate a strong enough clot dissolving response, over time the thrombus becomes organized. A thrombus that occludes the central retinal vein may develop small channels during the process of organization, which allow a certain amount of blood to pass through the clot. This is called recanalization. With regard to recanalization, Dr. Green's study found that all of the 24 eyes examined where the occlusion was two weeks old or older showed evidence of recanalization. Of the three eyes examined where the occlusion was one to four days old, two of the three eyes showed evidence of recanalization. And neither of the two eyes examined where the occlusion was less than 24 hours old showed signs of recanalization. In addition to recanalizing the thrombus, the body may attempt to bypass the blockage. You may recall the two circulation pathways that supply blood to the retina. In one pathway, the central retinal artery and central retinal vein supply blood to the retina from the inside of the eye, while in the second pathway, the choroid supplies blood to the retina from underneath the retina. During a central retinal vein occlusion, the first pathway through the central retinal vessels is impaired but the second pathway through the choroid continues to function. Collateral vessels then are vessels that connect the circulation pathway that's not working to the circulation pathway that is working, allowing a certain amount of blood to exit the eye through the outflow channels of the choroid, the vortex veins, without having to traverse the central retinal vein. It's the body's way of attempting to bypass the problem in the central retinal vein. To sum up then, insights into blood clots in the central retinal vein may help us as patients understand more about the natural course of central retinal vein occlusion. And although the precise cause of an occlusion in the central retinal vein will often remain unclear, a basic understanding of Firco's triad and the unique characteristics of the central retinal vein 
give us a framework with which to begin to understand how an occlusion may have developed in our particular circumstances.